Chapter 3 Once upon a family, there was a grandson who should have been dead. All right, well, have you ever met someone who, who just couldn't get, catch a break? You know what I mean? Ever meet somebody who you looked at and it seemed like everything that they did, they just got the raw end of the deal, or you're like, man, I am glad I'm not that person. Well, I know I, I've come across people like that from time to time. And, and this morning, as we, be, we continue the series called Once Upon a Family, we are going to look at one of those kind of guys uh, that couldn't catch a break. He's, he's a guy who, uh, well, he was named something that, uh, well, all of us are probably really thankful our names are not. And also, you're probably thankful you're not standing up here and you have to actually pronounce this name. But his name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. It sounds kind of like a disease, doesn't it? Yeah, probably one of those stories you maybe not have heard all that much about. And yet, he's a guy huh, that couldn't catch a break, but in the end, he received more than he could possibly ever deserve. Well, let's get started. Let's dive in. If you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to pull that out. Uh, we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you've got a smartphone, you can pull that out, or iPad, whatever. You can uh, pull that out. You can check in here at Facebook at Christ Little Rock. Uh, then you can, uh, you can even post something later in the service if there's something that hits you, something that you learn. But you can go to this website up here where you can follow on and interact in a whole different kind of way. Now, if we're going to dive into Mephibosheth, what we got to do is we have to dive into the backstory to understand what this is all about. See, Mephibosheth comes from a royal family. In fact, his grandfather is a guy named King Saul. King Saul is the very first king of Israel. And so the people of Israel, the people of God, this nation of Israel, and they went through a time where they said, you know what, we want a king. And yet God said... You don't want a king. No, I'll be your king. But they get to a certain point, and they argue with God. In fact, 1 Samuel 8, verse 6, they say, give us a king to lead us. Well, this displeased Samuel. Samuel is a prophet that was being used by God during this time. And so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not that they have rejected you, but they have rejected me as their king. Well, then we jump down to verse 9. It says, now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And so Samuel starts to warn them that, you know, living under a king is not going to be quite as cool as you think it's going to be. It, there's going to be some uh, big issues at times. Sometimes it's going to be good, but other times they're going to use and abuse and rule over you. They won't be as loving and merciful and sacrificial as God is as your king. But the people, if you look down at verse 19, they say, no, we want a king over us. And then we'll be like all the other nations with kings to lead them, lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. <laughs> So when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. And so Samuel went out and he found a king and the guy was named Saul. And actually in the beginning, believe it or not, it worked out really good because Saul was a good king. He was a just king. He was a strong king. He led the people into battle after battle and he engaged in these wars and he, he, he ruled them well and helped them to expand. But as the success came, huh, Saul's greed grew. His arrogance festered, and eventually he started to look to himself, not to God. Eventually, he started to become a guy who didn't foul God. He fouled only himself. And so, again, God sent Samuel to speak to Saul. He says in chapter 15, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he, God, has rejected you as king. Since you are fouling yourself and not God, guess what? God doesn't have your back anymore. You're on your own. Well, while Saul was still king of Israel, Samuel privately anointed a new king, a young, well, shepherd 
musician who was named David as going to be the new king. And during that time, Saul was quickly losing it. In fact, if you read through 1 Samuel, you'll see he like is it's just kind of going crazy. I don't know if it's the pressure of being keen. I don't know if it's post-traumatic disorder of some sort from the wars he went through. I don't know if it's his ego, if it's uh, you know, his, his arrogance or whatever, but he is losing it. And, and in the process, he's trying to figure out ways to like gain control, to have perspective. And now some people, they go fishing to relax. Anybody? A few? Some people, they, they love watching movies or vegging out in front of football, go bears <laughs> or razorbacks for most of you. Uh, some people... <laughs> They listen to music like Saul. And, and so Saul asked that David would come and play for, for him. The, the, the same David that had already been anointed by God to be the successor to this king was playing music for him. If he only knew that, he would have been paranoid. He would have, he would have schemed to take out the threat. But he didn't know. A couple years later... Um, David has this, this monumental event in front of the giants. Maybe you've heard about it. You know, where all of a sudden and they're, they're up against the Philistines and, and, and this giant says, I'll fight your best warrior. And, and, and King Saul is their king and he is their greatest warrior, but there's no way he's going up against this giant. But David, with five smooth stones and a sling, says, I'll do it. And, and as he let that stone go and as it hit the the giant, and as the giant fell, he was an overnight phenomenon. He was uh, amazing, and, like he became a legend. And even then, Saul embraced him. In, in fact, Saul made him a great leader in his army, and Saul brought him into his family. In fact, there, Saul and, and Saul's, I mean, David and Saul's son, Jonathan, they become best friends. They become like brothers. They're inseparable. Well, over the following years, if you turn to 1 Samuel 18, David begins to, to grow and grow in his success as a leader in Saul's army to the point that when he's coming back from a certain war, the people come out and they start shouting and singing and they say things like this. Uh, verse 7, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Probably didn't go over very well for Saul. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. And they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but my kingdom? And from that day on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Actually, it moves really quick. Because actually, it's more than just kept an eye on him. He starts scheming because he's already labeled David a threat, and he's got to take out the threat. And so he looks for opportunities to kill him. Ironically, it's Jonathan, Saul's son, who helps David to escape from Saul, Saul's uh, plan to kill him. And, and, and so David takes off and gets with other people who are loyal to him, who, who are, are, are going to help him. And, and they, they leave that area. And yet Saul is so obsessed, he's ready to chase him to the ends of the earth. And so eventually David and his little posse, they end up leaving Israel altogether. And they go into the Philistines <laughs> and they go to where Saul's enemies were to find refuge. Those same enemies, they go up against Saul and his army, and they eventually, they kill Saul. And many of the other leaders of his army, including Jonathan, Saul's best friend like a brother. But when the news comes to David, David understands, okay, now I can, I can go. I can, I can go back to Israel. But he comes back to Israel with a heavy heart, knowing that the king that he still respected was dead. But not only that, his, his best friend, Jonathan, was dead. And he gets there, and as soon as he's there, he is made king officially over the, the southern part of Israel, which is called Judah. And, and at that same time, uh, one of Saul's other sons, Ishbosheth, he is, say that really fast a bunch of times, <clears throat> 
He is, he's king of the northern region of Israel at that time. And, and so there's this big war that's going on between Saul's family and David's family during this time. And, and slowly but surely, David gets stronger and stronger until finally one day, Ish, Ish, Ishbetheth, Ishbetheth, oh man, now I can't say it. Anyway, we'll call him I. I, uh, he finds out that his, his, one of his comrades and one of his his loyal friends and leaders is killed. And he and his family, they freak out and they say, we gotta go, we gotta bolt. And it's in the midst of that that we finally find this Mephibosheth. In fact, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter four. We'll pick it up at verse four. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a, saw, a son who was, na- was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. So this nurse or this nanny of some sort was uh, grabbed this five-year-old boy and somehow in the midst of the bedlam, all the chaos that was going on, he falls, he gets injured, not, not just a small little injury, not like a, a scuffed up knee, no, he gets crippled in this injury as they're trying to leave. And, and this is not just any boy because just a little bit later, Ifbosheth, he ends up getting killed. And, and Methabosheth is the only one from the royal bloodline that is still alive. Now, there are times where it's a really good thing to be a part of the royal bloodline, isn't there? And there's times when it's a really bad thing, when it's like a curse to be, like when, uh, you know, another entity comes in and takes over the empire, and, and what do they want to do? They kind of want to wipe the slate clean. They want to make sure that there's no, no pieces of that dynasty that's left. And so that's where Mithbosheth is at. He's this boy who's orphaned, handicapped. He's a boy who's an enemy of the state. And he goes hiding as he's helpless and condemned. And so Paul comes into power. And he becomes a king of all of Israel, the whole Israel. He's a good king. He's a just king. He's a righteous king. He's God's king. He's a God who doesn't look to himself to say, okay, what should I do? He looks to God. He wants to do what's right in God's eyes. And God blesses him as king, and he blesses his people. Now turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Because then 20 years later, a couple decades later, all of a sudden, David remembers a promise that he made to Jonathan as Jonathan was helping him uh, escape from his dad's persecution. He he promised that he would, uh, if he ever got out of this, he would always watch out for Jonathan's family. He would take care of his family if he had the opportunity. We pick it up at verse 1. So David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. Now jump to verse 3. Ziba answered the the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both feet. Well, where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Makar, son of Amelia, in Lober. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makar, son of Amelia. When Mephibosheth, son of, of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Now, I, I want to pause here for just a moment because I think there's something critical that we need to kind of understand as we read through God's word. Um, who here has ever watched a movie? Well, this is a dumb question. Who here has watched a movie? Everybody has. Okay. You watch the movie, and <laughs> thank you, and, and, and you get to the end of the movie, right? And, and the credits are rolling, and, and all of a sudden your mind starts going, and, and you think back to like an event that happened in the beginning or in the middle, and you're like, ah, I see it. You know, I, I didn't realize it before, but that's pointing to, to the answer that I didn't know. I, I see how it all kind of connects, how it, it foreshadows, how it, it, it points to how it ends. 
Ever been there? Or, or better yet, you know, you've seen a series of movies like Harry Potter. Anybody see that? Me either. All right. Um, <laughs> Or, or, or Star Wars or something like that that I actually seen. And, and you go through these different episodes of, of, the, of the series, right? And, and they kind of, they, they keep building. And, and they're all pointing to this big, com- this climax, right? This, this big ending of sorts. Well, that's how we should look at this. I mean, this is the story of the salvation of mankind. And so when we're looking at some of these Old Testament stories, as we're diving in, we're looking at Moses and David and Noah and all these different things, these totally true stories, what we realize is they're all pointing to something that's coming. You know what they're pointing to? They're pointing to Jesus. That, that as we go through here, uh, those things are being fulfilled eventually in Jesus. They're, in fact, you might say, actually, a lot of scholars say, that there's these types, there's these glimmers, there's these pictures that we see of a Messiah that comes, of this Jesus that comes. And even in the most uh, obscure little stories, ones we don't even know, we not only see a type, a glimmer of Jesus, we also see a type, a glimmer of those who Jesus is come to save. And so we go back to our story that we're into today. And all of a sudden, we, we, we start to look at, well, Methabasheth, this, this crippled outcast. And, and so the question that we have is, is, who is he a type of? Who does he resemble and look like? I mean, think about it. I'd like to say he's a type, he's a glimmer of you and me. And I know, I get it. I mean, we, we, we don't like that. We're kind of uncomfortable with that. We, we don't want to be referred to as somebody who's lame and incapable and something like that. We don't want to be, in fact, we do a lot of things to help people see that we're not like Method Chef, right? We might run to Fitness 10 or, or do all kinds of exercise or Weight Watchers, you know, to control the body. We may go hire coaches, life coaches. We may, we may go and listen to motivational speakers or read really good books to help us to figure out how to like have good willpower and be able to be successful and all those kinds of things. I'm not saying, you know, exercise isn't good. I'm not saying that coaching, mentoring, all that stuff's not good. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, willpower's not good. I'm just saying it's not the answer because it always comes up short, doesn't it? You always get to a point where all of a sudden you're like, well, yeah, it's I feel like I'm kind of losing it. In fact, there's been a number of times, even this last week, the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to people, and, and I can relate, I really can, how we love to come up to the cliff in our life, you know what I mean? And, and live on the edge of this cliff because we want to experience everything we can. We want to, we want to make all these things happen. We want uh, to be involved in all these different things. And there are moments that we're here and we're like, we got this. You know what? This is cool. We're involved in all kinds of stuff and, and things are going great. But then all of a sudden, Oh, something happens at work, or all of a sudden sales are down, or all of a sudden you look down and you gain five or ten pounds, or all of a sudden you, you got a kid who got in trouble, or, or, or there's tension in this relationship with your spouse or, or somebody else, and then you get this heart-pounding feeling like you're about ready to fall over the edge. You get this crushing feeling like the world is coming down on top of you. You know what I mean? Yeah, you and I, we are, we're like Mephibosheth, at least spiritually speaking. He's a type, he's a glimmer uh, of you, a person in need of saving. In fact, the sin inside of you uh, means that you're born the son or the daughter of the wrong bloodline, the wrong king. The sin inside of you means that you are, you're overwhelmed with this, 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 
this control that has on you to go chasing after things of this world, of, of going chasing after money, uh, of, of being at war with yourself or being consumed by yourself that leads you not to be able to help yourself. And just like Mephibosheth, you have no future, no inheritance, no hope. You're an enemy of the state, and you deserve judgment and condemnation. So Mephibosheth is ordered to go see David, this King David, the, the other royal wine. And he goes bracing himself for the worst. Because he knows that's what he deserves. He knows that's what should be coming. And, and so as a crippled, he slowly, he awkwardly lowers himself. I mean, get that picture in your mind. Awkwardly lowers himself to the ground in front of this King David. And he bows in honor. Verse 7. And David says, don't be afraid. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. That's a lot. He was the, he was the king. <laughs> and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that, that you should notice a dead dog like me? I love that, dead dog. Mephibosheth, he looked at himself and he didn't expect grace. He, he knew he didn't deserve grace. He looked at his legs, at his, at his life, at his heritage, and he knew he was hopeless and condemned. And he was ready for what he had got coming. And yet, this is not a story about hopelessness or condemnation. No, this is a story about somebody who couldn't catch a break. And yet, in the end, he received more than he could possibly deserve. Look at verse 9. So then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's sir, steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belongs to Saul and his family. You and your, your sons and your servants are to farm the land for, for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your, your master, will always eat at my table. Jump it down to verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. It's an amazing story as, as David looks at this young man and spares his life and gives him back his inheritance. And most amazingly, more than anything else, he treats this, this young man as his son. And he invites this crippled man to his table. It's crazy. Now, you have to understand at this time, it, it, was, it, was, it was a huge privilege to be invited to somebody's table, anybody's table, let alone the king's table, because it was a sign of, of, of love, of trust, of vulnerability to let somebody come to the table. It was a sign of intimacy. And, and so today it doesn't really translate like, because I'll go to lunch with any of y'all, right? <laughs> but but maybe, maybe it's a better picture is like, um, you know, me inviting you over on a Friday night to my family room as we watch the things I recorded this past week or, uh, you know, an old movie or something where I'm just... I'm just wearing whatever I want to wear because I want to be comfortable. I just want to be me. That's what David invited Mephibosheth into. That's what he offered to this guy, this cripple. He accepted him unconditionally, even even though Mephibosheth had nothing to offer. And in this gesture of a merited grace, of love, of, of acceptance, David becomes this type, he becomes this picture, this glimmer 
of Jesus. Because you think about it, you forward to things a little bit farther, and we, we get to the point that, that we realize that you know, God had promised that he's going to rescue his creation, his creation that's rebelled. But then all of a sudden, we get to that point, and, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes to earth, and he lives this life that, that was perfect, a life we couldn't live. And he died this death that was unmerited, that we should have had. And all of a sudden, what we realize is that he wins us this inheritance that that we don't deserve. On that cross, he becomes, he pays a penalty so that we can have the prize that we don't deserve. In fact, listen to these words in Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, meaning daddy, father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And also, so I realized so that so even though I'm broken, I'm lame, I'm incapable of living up to the, to the potential that God has created me for, I am. I, I realize that Jesus, my mighty and incredible king, has come in and adopted me as a son. And he invites you and me to his table. In fact, think about that for just a moment. Just a little while ago, I, I hope you came up in some kind of way to this table. And the reality is, is that you're a mess. I mean, I, I may not know all of your stories, but I do know parts of some of your stories. I know my story. And I, I look at my life, I look at my, my last week, and I know I'm a mess. And you're a mess. You know, we do not have it all together. We do not deserve to come to this table. We do not deserve to come in the presence of God. What we deserve is condemnation, and yet what God offers to us is this VIP pass to come up to him and to receive things that we can, we're blown away by. That he would actually offer us grace, forgiveness, a new beginning. And so we're invited and welcomed, redeemed. You know, my prayer is that that really sinks in. Because so often, I, I really do, I, I believe we, we stand on this edge of life and, and, and we, we jump bef- between two places. So often we're here and we're like, we're on top of the world. You know what? We don't need anything. And in those moments, my prayer is that you would realize that you are lame and incapable. (laughs) That you're a cripple. But then all of a sudden life comes, doesn't it? And it tears us down. And we feel like we're going over the edge. And in those moments, my prayer is that you would know the promise that God has given to you. That even though you are lame and incapable outside of Jesus, in Jesus, you're redeemed. You're forgiven. You're loved. You're restored. You have a whole new beginning and purpose. As, uh, as we wrap up this morning, I, I do, there's one little thing I, wa- I want you also to see. is Mephibosheth is not just a type, a glimmer of us, but sometimes things get turned around in our relationships, and all of a sudden, uh, we start to see that we can be a glimmer, a type of Jesus, actually. And, and so just as David invites Mephibosheth to his table, and, and is this kind of this glimmer, this type of Jesus... We can do that with others, too. And so think about this for one second. Who in your life could you invite to your table? 
And I know that, that's scary, right? And we, we don't want to be vulnerable. I mean, we, we get kind of stressed out about all that stuff, you know, letting people into our lives and know us a little bit more than, than just our name or, or things we, we put out on the side to the facade we give. But who could you actually invite in to your life? I mean, as you look out into your life, who could you actually share Jesus and the grace, the mercy that he offers? See, God hasn't only, he hasn't only asked us to do that, but he's wired us in a way to do that. Because see, it's in relationships that is kind of the fuel for life. It's not willpower or anything. It's relationships. And, and in relationships, that's how we get the chance to share the grace, the love of Jesus in a real tangible way. How we get to share it, how we get to receive it. And so look in your life and who in your life is feeling condemned or feeling like the world's fallen down upon them. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a family outcast or, or maybe it's, gosh, you know, maybe it's something dramatic. Maybe it's, it's a child you could adopt. Maybe, maybe it's, Maybe it's a neighbor down the road that's really lonely. Maybe it's somebody who's been on your heart and your mind that you know is just kind of struggling. And, and what could you give to them that they can't find anywhere else? How can you allow them into your life so that they can see Jesus? You know, once upon a family, there was a there was a grandson who should have been condemned and dead. And yet, in the end, he received more than he possibly deserved. He was a cripple that was invited to sit right next to the king at his table. Just like you and me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, as we look at this story, gosh, we can identify we identify with Mephibosheth and the fact that, that we are crippled and a mess. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you still accept us. You love us. You welcome us to your table. Lord, in the same way, though, also, we can look at people around us and we can see that they need that same acceptance and love and grace that we desperately need. Lord, help us to open up our eyes to see how we can be a glimmer a type, a picture of you so that they would see the grace that only comes from you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.